Yeah, hi and welcome. My name is Sebastian, and today I'm giving you a tour of Share Secrets Safely. Uh, on the Beamer or on screen for those who watch this on YouTube on the Rust channel, hint, hint, they uh, see it on screen. Uh, the repository here, which claims that Share Secrets Safely is there to allow teams to avoid, avoid plain text secrets from day one. And you are probably saying, I never have plain text secrets in my projects. I never have clear text secrets credentials to my production database in code. Never. So this is not for you. Turn it off. Save your time. We don't need this. But maybe you do. Because maybe you've been using GPG before or GoPass or any of these GPG-ish thingies. And maybe you also didn't like it very much because of the user interface, the command line interface feeling a bit old, feeling a bit 1980s, 1990s. It does work, but if you're not an expert, it's a little hard to understand what the heck it is talking about when it says unusable public key. What? Which public key? What is going on? And this is what Share Secrets Safely tries to do much better. Share Secrets Safely uh, will allow you and your team to, well, store and encrypt your secrets using GPG, but have a front end that is totally 2017. <laughs> Still pretty new. And here's how I, how I did it. Uh, motivation was, of course, that I've seen many teams, and I still do see many teams who have plain text secrets, and I spend a lot of my time to make that better. And this is the culmination of all of these experiences. It's the best I have to give to society to make it easy to bring your secrets from the encrypted form to the final destination without them ever touching disk or, you know, can be without ever them being intercepted by third parties. How does it work? Yeah, of course, it's a Rust meetup, so a lot of Rust here. As you can see, it's like totally 60% of Rust. <laughs> Apparently, the, the 70s strike back, a lot of shell scripting here, 36%. I will show you why that is. And um, I think I'll start with the idea of Share Secret Safely. Like, how do I develop that software? And to me, it was most important because I said usability is so important to me that I said I do not want to write anything that I do not test myself, that I cannot, where I cannot verify that the usability is nice for me as a user and for everybody. Therefore, I spent some time thinking about testing before I even started writing a single line of code. You can test with, with Rust, cargo test, and you run your test. That's easy. Unit test kind of thingies. You can also test command line interfaces these days with something that's called uh, assert CLI. I don't know, there might be somebody in the room who knows more about it. Who could that possibly be? Uh, Killer Cup, I think, is the one who might have written it. But this was before the time of this one, so I didn't use it. So what I'm doing is I wrote a little shell-based uh, utility library with about 100 lines of code that spits out tests like these. So this is when you run the tests here. And as you can see, you can say with a single GPG user when initializing the vault with a resource directory with no explicit recipients file, it succeeds. And here and there, you can make your expectations readable for the world. And when you write this, it's a Rust meetup and I'm showing shell. It's kind of odd, I know. But it's one of the best points about the project that when you're implementing a feature, what you do is you basically use this little DSL, it's just shell, it's just bash. But it's really easy to read, sandboxed something, have a title, with and when, set up your state, and in the end you do your expectations. Lots of snapshot testing I do here, just because snapshots are so easy to use. First run, it creates a snapshot. Second run, it c compares the snapshot that you already have with the actual program output. It allows me to set my expectations right away because I really just write the file I say here, this is how it should look like, more or less. And then I start the implementation. And then eventually, when it looks like it, it's cool. And when I, when I break it, which also happens from time to time, uh, you know, any character change will immediately trigger a test failure. These tests, they run like this. I, I differentiate between stateless journey tests and those that run in Docker. And the stateless ones, they run like that. Yeah, yeah. 
It's really fast too, right? It probably calls the, the Rust command a few hundred times in these few seconds that you have seen the, the text running over the screen. It's so fast that you can now afford journey tests, tests that actually represent the user value in every detail that you can run them exclusively. I do have like 20 unit tests where it made sense and everything else is journey tests. So here, once again, the reason why I want to do this is because it actually captures the value that I bring to the user and it allows me as a developer to use my tool and to see how it feels. I play around with this until I like it, then I implement it. Maybe I change it again, but I change it on a very high level, which is what the user in the end will see. Thus, I know that all the happy path and all the unhappy path that I could think of are captured so that I say, yes, this is what I would want to see as, a, as an error output, for example, when certain common issues with GPG happen. Second thing, why Rust? Because right now I don't really have an, you know, I could have done it in C. And that's true, I could have done it in C. Nah, not really. I could not have done it in C. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. But Rust allows us to do all these things without being, being god-like creatures. And uh, the library called GPG-me is what I use to make direct use of GPG. So tools like pass, pass.sh, the Unix, Unix password manager, and gopath, under the hood, they call GPG the command line tool. It's nice. It's, it's working. However, GPG, the command line tool, will easily, between the minor releases or patch releases, whatever that is for them, change the way they interpret certain arguments. And they might just, you know, your argument that you use so far might just not work or trigger some annoying message that says, I'm guessing what you're doing and so on. So I'm saying using the command line interface as your program, as your API, is not a good thing to do for portability. It's really a problem. Um, so using the GPG me library directly is quite fantastic. And all you need to do here to do it in Rust is use GPG me. And you have a very nice Rust, Rusty interface around that C library that probably itself is really hard to use. But with Rust, it becomes easy to use. Fantastic. I don't have problems with resource allocation and deallocation. I mean, have you ever tried to use a C library? You have to init stuff, you have to make calls in the right order and totally not forget anything. Because if you do, you segfault things, you have undefined behavior. That doesn't happen in Rust, I can't do it wrong. It's so easy to use these libraries, which gives me a stable interface that I can rely on that way I can understand what kind of error GPG me communicates to me. And I wrap this in something that is easier to understand for the ordinary user who just wants to do some crypto to get rid of um, to get rid of plain text secrets in their in their code base. The next thing that was incredibly important to me as usability is so important to me is documentation. Because having a great self-documented tool, which is Sai here by the way, first time I showed this, it uses clap of course. Having a nicely documented tool with clap is really easy. But it's not necessarily what people want to use to get started with the tool. And also, you know, there's certain complexity associated with it, certain ideas that you want to wrap your head around that you have to write more about than in self-documenting help. So what this thing does, it refers you, you to that self-hosted documentation, which is this. So some of you might already know, know this one. It's MDBook. That is not really MDBook, because if you look, for instance, at the installation instructions here, you will see a lot of code, like some curling here, some GPG verification, because, you know, I provide signatures with my um, binaries so that you can verify that I created them and you can hopefully trust them because you trust me. You do trust me, right? We know each other. <laughs> but this code here, there's so much stuff happening and it can be so wrong. I mean, you know documentation, you write it once and then you usually don't test that again. And I wanted to not only have the commands that you should execute to do certain things, but also I wanted to show the actual output of these commands. And I could do this manually once, then I have to copy paste a lot of stuff into static files and that really is not only error prone, but I also know this will go stale the week after. I didn't want that. So what I do is, or what I did to make that possible is, I wrote a little wrapper around MDBook, which does not yet support the kind of plugins that I would have needed. 
and call it Termbook. MDBook became Termbook. And Termbook allows you to add certain annotations in your markdown that will tell Termbook to execute the code block below and to possibly capture the output of the program and put it right after. So the documentation that you see here, it's asserting itself. It's tested documentation. So I not only say, I want to capture this output here, I want to run this and capture the output, I also say this should be successful. And if something in there breaks, this is why you see curl dash dash fail, if something in there breaks, then my documentation will not build and my entire build on CI will fail. Yes, I do have CI CD, of course. I don't think that that is a question here. But this is how the documentation is guaranteed to never be stale. And this is how it's actually fun to write this. I do not execute everything, obviously, but most of the things I execute. And because I'm kind of lazy with documentation, for the most part, you just see me literally executing scivault in a dash dash help and capturing the output and that's it. So <laughs> documentation is still something I, I should, have been, uh, should write a bit more of. Um, however, there's some getting started with the world, which is more like a tutorial. If you're interested in this at all, uh, you should read that because that t shows you kind of the basic ideas about it. If you have ever used some crypto tool for your uh, program, for your deployments whatsoever, <coughs> you know that it doesn't start or it doesn't end with, the, with getting encrypted passwords right. It doesn't end there at all because nice that you have, have them encrypted in your, in your repository, but how do you process them? You have, to take, you have to decrypt them at some point and somehow bring the decrypted value to where it belongs, somewhere in your program, somewhere in the environment of your program that is deployed in some Kubernetes somewhere, in some cloud somewhere. And that's usually when the next great issue happens that I've seen in many teams. They start writing their own templating engines in Bash. They roll their own and so many versions of it. The fewest people find nsubst, which is a very nice tool that does like everything they usually want. Many use sed and fancy loops and lots of, I've seen a lot and I didn't like any of this because yes, you don't want a templating engine and some processor and you want to build your model that contains all the values, the secret values and not so secret values. And then you want to substitute them in to some file, some configuration, some manifest, whatever you call it, that in the end defines how you deploy the application. So share secret safely doesn't end with the crypto. It gives you all the tooling that you need to go from decrypting your secrets to the final deployment. This here is just an example. Let's go through this line, uh, line by line or step by step because I think it's important to get an idea of what else Share Secret Safely does for you. The basic idea is that you first build a model. A model is just a tree, you know, it's a structured data, some, a bunch of properties in some tree-like structure that define something that you're interested in. In this particular example, what we do is we merge some infrastructure secrets some information about our team and some information about our current stage. You know, stages, general concept, you have pre-production stage, you have production stage at the very least. You merge all that information that is in structured files, usually JSON or YAML, whatever you prefer. You merge that into one big tree. And that is your model that you will then subsequently use to substitute it into templates that for in, in this case, um, declare, for instance, declare your Kubernetes manifests, which are also just structured files. And we substitute these in here and out comes a bunch of dash 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 separated files, uh, sorry, a bunch of dash 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 separated uh, YAML documents that go to SCD out and are then just applied directly by Kubernetes, which reads that from standard input. This data stream here is completely held in memory, never touches disk, and uh, contains your secret safely. What you also see here is some, that's just bash syntax, which allows you to run a program, take the output of the program, put it into a name pipe that is temporary, and feed the path to the name pipe to a program 
that just wants to read files. So in case of Kubernetes, for example, you can provide it with a custom configuration that allows it to get all the secrets that it needs to access the cluster and whatever you want to, whatever system you want to deploy to. And it reads this information from a file that is literally just a temporary that you decrypt on the fly. <coughs> and this is the idea, this is the tooling that is provided by Share Secrets Safely. And just to give you this little uh, hint about it, there is the processing, the data processing. It's all about merging your model, about merging multiple files together, manipulating your files uh, to get the model that you want to use for the substitution. The substitution is the thing that uses some data in your model, takes some one or more documents that contain these handlebars that you know from, yeah, mustache handlebars from all the templating uh, engines. And these handlebars are then substituted by the values that are in that model that you've just built on the fly. And out comes the, the final substituted files that you can feed into another program that will then make your deployment or do the last step that brings your program to production. This is all that Share Secret Safely does for you. And of course, you know, the, the last step you would ask, okay, how do I use it? How do I get it? How do I install it? How do I get started with it? Okay, you can brew it. Those of you who are on, on Mac, you can brew things, and I think in the installation guide, this was right up front here. Right now, there's only a tab, but it's really easy to do. And if you're willing to brew my code, you can. If you're not so willing to brew my code, if you rather want to do it a bit more manually, what you can do is do just that. You git clone this URL, share secrets safely, getting started. It's a tiny repository. It's really just a bunch of scripts. And now you can just execute Psy directly. And the first time you execute this, it will download the binary for your particular platform. And then, then you have it there locally. As you can see now here in bin Darwin, there's the actual binaries that do all the work. And here, the Psy binary, the Sheezy binary in short, by the way, there's Share Secret Safely is abbreviated to Sheezy. Uh, that's the main hub kind of binary. It has all the subcommands, all the capabilities built in. It has the vault, which is the crypto stuff. It has substitution engines built in. It uses liquid because it has so many nice filters that, that you can use uh, to get your things done. You have the processor, which is the thing that merges, that builds your model and outputs that, that is JSON or YAML for consumption by the substitution engine. And yeah, an additional small tool for extracting individual values, which can be useful when you want to integrate that tooling into bash scripts or other um, yeah, scripting-like languages. We're nearly out of time. That is Share Secret Safety in a nutshell. I could, if you had more time, I would of course show you how that is actually used, how you build a model from partially encrypted data from partially world-readable data like your team information, team name, and so on, or project data. Build your model, substitute that into a Kubernetes manifest, and deploy that to a locally running Kubernetes cluster. I've done that demo elsewhere. Here, we are focused, focusing, focusing on the high level to show you what Share Secret Safely is, why it's there, the kind of quality you can expect from it, how you get started. And I hope that you know gives you enough motivation to have a further look. And of course, to be the one who gives me the 50th star on GitHub. That would be awesome. Thanks a lot, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> For the questions. What would be the next steps? Like, uh, what, what would you want to see from a contributor? Question was, what would be the next steps? And what would you like to see from a contributor? Actually, do have a roadmap. And the roadmap basically says, write more documentation. Because I think that is not se severely missing, but it would be better to have a bit more. And that's the only reason I'm not posting this on Reddit every day, uh, because I really want to. But I kind of lack the motivation. Contributors, 
Hmm. If you want to write a tutorial or a blog post, I think that would be much appreciated. You can also write the markdown. You know, it's easy to write that in markdown and run Termbook on it and uh, contribute some docs that are useful for you or usable by you. That is even better because to my mind, it's feature complete. We're using this. I use this everywhere where there's a need for this kind of tooling and usually there's always a need for this kind of tooling. Uh, this is why it is what it is. It's production ready. And the additional features that you see on the roadmap, I don't think I will ever implement them because I don't need them myself. I'm not, re I'm not into them anymore. The only thing is documentation and please contribute that. I think that is it for the questions. And uh, thanks a lot.